Project Halls, 40 side win, seen it all. I can sit niggas and slide. I'd rather show them the ropes. Integrity matters the most. I get a hood hope. Damn, I get a hood classics. Something to open your mind instead of going out crashing. How was you real when you hate the real? God, I'm simply asking. Can't just talk. Another episode of the Course Side Takeover Podcast. I'm Diz. What it do? It's your boy Dwight. And we sitting here with the new Hughes head basketball coach, Coach Brandon Grammer. What's going on? Let's start off by saying congratulations on the new position, Coach. Congratulations, Coach. Coach. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Happy to have you guys here interviewing us. And uh, can't wait to get started. Yes, sir. So, um... Well, let's get started, man. Um, how how it feel? We just completed your first day here, man. You in the building now? I see you with the red on. Yeah. Welcome to the family. So, how it feel to just finally be in the building? You here now? Like just good. It was a good first day of school. You know, the kids coming in, learning the new way of doing things, and uh, got a new principal who, you know, she's all about discipline and getting the kids doing the right stuff. And uh, it was a little bit of a struggle for these kids learning the schedule, learning their building, especially the freshmen and. Uh, the seventh graders, but it, it was good to see kids again, especially in the building. You yeah. know, even though we have masks and everything, it's just good to see kids walking around together. It's been so it is mask mandated. Masks are mandated, okay. so staff and students wear masks. Uh, but at least they're in the hallway together. Right. They're right. not at yeah. home. You know, they're not virtual, and uh, it's somewhat normal. Not all the way, but at least they're somewhat. Somewhat. Yeah. And we don't worry too much about the distancing. It's three feet. Kind of thing, you know, it's not like the six feet where you got to keep these kids so far apart and stuff. So uh, it's been a good change for these these kids, and you can feel it. So, what what's the biggest change for you coming into a, CP, a Cincinnati Public School, coming from over at Holy Cross? Like, what's the biggest change for you? Uh, I'd say the size. Yeah, it's the biggest. And I taught in a Boone County school, so it's a little different. In Boone County school, that I taught it was Connor High School, and we had about 1,600 kids in the high school. So like, yeah, coming over here where they're like, we've got 500 and something high school kids. I'm like, that's, <laughs> that's it. That's yeah. a third, you know, that's a third. So I, I can handle that. That's not, not too big of a school. And uh, it just, the big thing though, is this size of the building is ridiculous. Man. You know, you got 500 <laughs> kids and it's like, you got four floors or something like that. And I'm going through, I, found, I got lost trying to find the South Gym. Long ago, man. I'm like, how do I even find this thing? <laughs> the crazy thing about it, man, it's all a circle. <laughs> it, it, it is. You just keep walking, man. It's just never ending. Man. But yeah. let's get, take it back to the beginning. I don't know. I'm sorry to cut you off. No, no, you're good. Let's take it back to the beginning, man. You know, you all, you finally here in the, in the city. I know yeah. you're probably pretty familiar with Cincinnati, but if people may not know, who is Coach Grimmer and what got you into coaching? Oh, uh, well, this will be in. I know it doesn't seem like it, this will be my 19th year, I believe, coaching high school basketball. Uh, started coaching in 2003, uh, was just a sophomore in college, and uh, I knew I knew at a very young age that I wasn't good enough to play at the college level. I knew I wasn't good enough to be, you know, make basketball playing a career, so uh, I really wanted to get into the coaching side of it. Uh, I was coaching middle school, like uh, intramurals and, you know, select league, things like that for a the time I was a sophomore in high school. So like I've always known coaching is what I wanted to do. Uh, so I got my first assistant varsity job at the age of 21. Uh, yeah, so here I am going into year 19 and this will be, I think my ninth year as a head varsity coach. Uh, so, but it was a it was a journey, man. You know, I, I tell people all the time, it wasn't like, you know, you just move up a ladder and you just keep, keep going, you know, it's, it started with me wanting to be a teacher and wanting to be a coach, and that started late. Uh, I didn't get my teaching certification until I was 28 years old. Uh, so I started teaching at that. Took my family 1,008 miles down to Florida and moved them so I could be a head varsity basketball coach and so I could teach. And I uh, went down there to a school of 2,500 kids. <laughs> yeah, we had 200 kids try out, and this was uh, this was an inner city school. You know, we were off Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, and. Uh, rough neighborhood, rough school, and you know we went in there and pretty much turned the program around and said, you know, this is going to be our program. And uh, we ran camps, did things nobody ever did down there. You know, we were successful, and my family they we wanted to move back up north, and so I went from there to a school in Louisville, uh, coached there in uh, Louisville Seneca, so another inner city school, and uh, eventually moved closer back up to home. To Grant County High School, and then I went to Holmes High School, and then to Holy Cross, and and now 
finally got to Q's and uh, this is one of those places where you know you have your eyes set on something you're like this is the school that I want to coach at and uh, my guy Brian Wine made it that way you know it's like uh, a, <laughs> yeah we worked together at five-star basketball camp and I think every year that one of the CPS schools jobs open up he's like man you gotta you gotta apply for this job you gotta apply for this job and I'm like you just want me to apply so you can beat me <laughs> I'm not gonna do that uh, but he you know when Hughes opened up and uh, again in July or end of June I, this was uh, I knew this is where I needed to be so, so you coach 19 years what like what's been the biggest challenge like year to year your team changes what's, what's been the biggest challenge like fa facing those different teams every year I think in, as far as like every team is different, no matter if you return a lot of kids or not, you know, you, you have different leaders stepping up. And uh, from my standpoint, the hardest thing is uh, taking that leadership role and letting somebody else with a different personality run with it. You know, like you, you can't have the same kid every year. Like that's, that's just not possible. You, the way you lead may not be the same way as like a Jay Sean Martin would lead. You know, like that's, that's true. That's, that's not the true. way it can be. So, uh, from year to year, X's and O's at the end of the day, it's, you know, there's a lot of better coaches than me at X's and O's, but uh, what I try to instill in our kids is you gotta take ownership of this team, you gotta take the leadership, no matter if you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, just Agreed. lead. Agreed. Agreed. So let, now, I'm gonna go back to what you said, you said you closed down in Florida, yeah. Now, did Florida turn you into a two-three coach down there? No, <laughs> I know, man. I played. We went mm -hmm. down to Florida one year, and uh, we faced a lot of two threes. And they was like, "Man, that's tradition around here mm -hmm. in Florida." And I'm like, "How?" Yeah, because it seemed like Florida got a lot of athletes. No, it's it, it's a weird thing down there as far as uh, different areas mm -hmm. have different styles of uh, that they lean towards. Gotcha. You know, and so where I was, it was a two-three. You know they played a lot of two three, but they also did a lot of three two stuff, and yeah. we changed their zones up. And and I've always been a guy who's like, I'd love it if you would zone me because then you know we could, it's easy to tear apart a zone if you want to. Uh, but no, I I'm still our bread and butter is going to be man to man defense. And uh, uh, I got Kevin Johnson on staff, played at UC. You know part of that you know era of dominance with UC and. Uh, we flat out said, you know, we want to get up in people and we want to play the old school UC defense and not just, you know, with the Mick Cronin stuff, but we want to keep it more and a lot of yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm breaking down. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have some uh, friends who have synergy. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of synergy. Oh, yeah. College coaches. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know how to log into synergy. <laughs> so uh, I got breakdown of old UC games. And so our guys, one of the first things we do in September is going to be watching old UC games and how Kenyon Martin and Steve Logan, you know, Demar Johnson, those guys yes, play right. defense. <laughs> and we're going to get up in people. Yes, I love that. I love that, especially for the for the city league, man. You know, a lot of teams love to play that way. So it's, yeah. it's definitely going to be interesting to see. So you know, um, like you know, coach at a lot of different places and a lot of different jobs. You know, bounced around a lot of times. Now, um, there's no mystery. The the type of school that he was is inner city school. He was currently, he was uh, previously at Holy Cross. Dealing with inner city kids can be a little challenging and a little different. What do you think the biggest difference is between Holy Cross and just the inner city school in general? Uh, being at Holy Cross, uh, I, I really believe that we are, people hear private school and they think, oh man, Holy Cross money and stuff. You would be shocked how many inner city kids we have at Holy Cross. Uh, just from a standpoint of where we are, where we were located in Covington. You know, it, it lends itself to being, uh, you have an influx of inner city kids who don't want to go to homes. Parents are like, we to send our kids to the homes, they send them to Holy Cross. So we still deal with the same family dynamics uh, that you would see out of Covington Homes. And so uh, people will probably put me on blast with this, but uh, I drive a minivan. And the whole reason I bought a minivan was because I said, you know what, my school's in Louisville, my school's in Florida. I had kids all the time in my car. You know, I'm driving them from place to place, and the only reason I got a minivan is so I could take my basketball players uh. home. <laughs> you know, I'm like, this is, it has nothing to do with me. Like, I, I care less. You know, what people think about my ride, don't matter to me. At the end of the day, I got to get kids from point A to point B, and I can fit six of them in my car, yeah, I'm gonna get that. And so that, from a standpoint of the difference, um, you know, if people will say kids are kids, they are, but we also have to know 
this disadvantages that they have, mm -hmm. and how can we eliminate those disadvantages? Um, what can we provide to them that maybe the other kids aren't getting? And I talked to an AAU guy the other day, and I said, you know, one of the problems that I see with inner city kids, as far as like basketball wise, is opportunity. You think about the Manimal elites or the uh, we'll say the Griffin elites, any of these school, any of these AAU programs, they may have one elite team, right. but then they have several money teams. Yeah. Well, how many of these inner city kids can afford those money teams? Exactly. So if they're not on the elite team, they're on a money team. And then we have the problem of how are they going to raise money to pay for all this stuff? Well, a lot of these families we can't afford it. So how can we eliminate that? So I'm trying to find ways that we as not just Hughes, but we as Cincinnati can eliminate some of the reasons why some of our kids aren't getting to the next level. Yeah, for sure, because I feel like a lot of it sometimes is just as guidance, and some people falling in with the wrong crowd, some just a different ment mentality than other kids. Absolutely. Yeah, it also could be an outlet too, though. I mean, I think um, a lot of times when you deal with inner city kids, they don't they use basketball as a like like the white said they use basketball as an outlet. Sometimes I don't want to go home because I got a babysit six different kids. My mom ain't there; she working right. two different jobs. Or right. if my daddy there, ain't no telling what he up to. That my little sister crying, everybody depending on me. Let me just get, let me just go to the gym and shoot. That's where I can release that. That's where I can get away at. Then I think. That's where the disconnect come in at because if people don't know that, they're like, man, this, this, this kid is going crazy. This kid is lashing out. But, hey, you not even know this court. This is a scapegoat because once he leaves this court, he got to go hold a baby, feed a bottle, cook dinner. It's, it's, it's right. a lot that come with that that people don't understand. But great perspective you put it in. Now, um, um, there, I heard that you applied for this job a couple times before this one. What make you so intriguing? Uh, I talked to Brian when, uh, when Coach Black got the job. And I talked to him and – you know, I was like, well, what's going on? Who's it going to? And when Coach Black got the job, I didn't apply for the position then uh, just because I knew, you know, he was probably going to get it, uh, just talking to Brian. Uh, I, I did apply for, like, I actually applied and interviewed at Aiken several years ago, a long time ago. Uh, I applied and interviewed at West High. Um, I applied, I, I mean, it's, I'm trying to think, uh, interviewed at Schroeder long, like, 10, maybe 10 years ago, something like that. <laughs> so like, uh, it's not, it's always been a thing where, uh, you know, I'm not just trying to get to the, you know, inner city kids or the school, but it's more like, this is where I feel uh, my gifts can be used more effectively. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I can say this, man, that the fact that you got the van, that's one of the biggest Maybe. steps for yes. inner city because, oh, yeah. like, you got you got guys that don't have rides and, yep. and, and, and and any way to get to a gym, and you you can be that outlet, bro. Yeah, sure. definitely. When, when Wayne was here, he used to I hated it. Oh my god, he used to make us come in at six o'clock in the morning. Yeah, but nobody, nobody. This is just the this is the difference in the gap. Nobody had rides. He rode a bike every day. Every day. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Like, that's why the van is so important because you said you can fit six people. Okay, this is starting five and six men. Come on, yeah. we can go play. Sure. Yeah. So you can do it. Like, the van is yeah. a great idea. That's like, that's a great first step because most, most coaches have a car. Yeah. Like, then they'd be like, well, if I can only fit three in here, so the rest of y'all got to pitch a ride or I got to. So that's a yeah. great first step. Great well, first step. My, my, my wife, and while we're on, my wife, she'll give me a hard time about this, but uh, we've got seven kids. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh. Yeah, so, but four of them, like, uh, my, I have three, and she is four, and, you know, now we have seven. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I keep telling her, I'm like, you know, I'm going to buy like, a 12 or 15 passenger van. Yeah. And she's like, no, you're not. I'm like, oh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to happen. And I'm like, and think about it, I'm going to have a whole team in my van. Like, right. it's just going to be like, all right, varsity guys, get in, we're headed to the game. <laughs> And she was like, you can't buy that. That can't be in our driveway. I'm like, it's going to be in our driveway. She's going to come home one day, and she's going to go, you bought it. Like, absolutely. Absolutely. Because I think that's the way it's got to be. But, like, you, I, I want to touch on, like, he went and rode his bike here. He rode his bike right. every day. So I talked to, uh, I'm teaching credit recovery. So some of the, if you don't know, like, credit recovery, that's where the kids, they fail a couple courses, and they need to get back. They need to get those credits back. And uh, I was talking to him today, we didn't do content stuff. Today I told him, I said, you know, what is it that separates successful from un unsuccessful? And the successful people don't war don't complain about the barriers, they eliminate barriers. Mm -hmm. You know, like you had a barrier of no ride, what'd you do? You eliminate it. So what barriers are in our kids' way that we can 
maybe eliminate, but at the same time, you have to have kids that want to eliminate them too. Yeah, yeah. that's a great way to put it. See, yeah, my, my, right. my thought process was always no excuses. That's, yeah. what, I, that's what I was Absolutely. taught. Absolutely. But the way you break it down makes way really? more sense because you're, you're actually breaking it down and explaining it to that kid instead of, hey, listen, man, no excuses. And now you, listen, what separates you from being successful doing this? Yeah, that's definitely a great way to put it. Man. Yeah, it's definitely a great way. So, um, see, Matt, you know, it's, it's a pretty rough lead. Being yep. a minority coach in this league, how do you plan on connecting with the other coaches? Uh, I, luckily, uh, actually, they had a meet and greet with Coach Miller uh, a couple of nights last week, I believe. And uh, I went to that, talked to uh, Coach Ozzy with the, you know, the Prophets, and, and uh, was able to meet with, I think I met all the coaches from the CMAC then. I think the only one I didn't meet was Woodrow's coach. I know he was there, but our, I think our paths just crossed. Uh, but I'm pretty sure I met uh, every single coach in the, in the CMAC. And, uh, you know, I was lucky enough at Holy Cross, we actually had, we scrimmaged Woodward at Louisville this summer. Um, you know, I scrimmaged here at Hughes a few times when Brian was here. And so I think, yeah, I'm, I guess, uh, the white coach and being the minority with the, the C Max coaches, but at the end of the day, you know, we love basketball. And that's where we connect, you know, like that Brian Wyant, he's my guy, you know, like and how do we connect? We connected at of all places five star basketball camp at, in Orlando, Florida. Man. Yeah, he comes down there and I'm down there and we connect and ever since then we you know, we've been tight, you know, we talk basketball, we follow each other's families and stuff like that. So it's that's not about, you know, oh that's white coach friend that's my, it's never been about that you know, yeah. it's always been that's my guy you know, that's yeah. my guy Brian and the, I'm his guy you know like that's how it works basketball is a way that you connect to people that you wouldn't connect with otherwise you know the thing about the opportunities you get you guys went to Florida several times you wouldn't have had that opportunity had it not been for basketball right. Right. so like at the end of the day the ball you know the game's going to go and you know we're going to be competitive we're going to fight and you know we're going to be like oh man I want his kid was going to be coming to Hughes, and now he's going to be going there. Yeah, that's going to happen. But at the end of the day, we want what's best for the kid, and the ball is going to stop eventually. Definitely. And when it does, you don't want to do anything to deter that person from having some kind of bad opinion. So I love it for the fact that you know, like a lot of these kids don't know, man. You you may go play AAU with a kid. He may be a different color. You know, you may yeah. go. Next the next level of college, you may go play with a kid. He's from Serbia. He's from Brazil. Go. He's from yeah. anywhere. You know, it's just about your mindset of how you gel with somebody. You know, yeah. just find that common ground, spark a conversation. It's, it's all about meeting new people, networking, man. That's the biggest thing, man. Yeah, I, I think and, and coming together in common ground and saying, you know, for sure, we're, we're fighting for the same thing. You know, I may not, and I'll just use an example. I may not coach Rayvon Griffith over at TAC, but you know what? I wish the best for him. And you know, if somebody comes to me and I can help him get to the next level, I'm gonna help him. Like if somebody comes to me and says, hey, what do you think about this kid? I'm gonna help him. I'm gonna do whatever I can to help that kid better himself. We actually we actually had a conversation with Coach Bruiser over at Gamble earlier this year mm -hmm. on the pod, and we were saying like, a lot of the coaches in the C-Mac are divided. And I, I mean, I, you, you know, you understand why, because like everybody's, Oh, we we trying to be C Mac champions, but right. and and and, a, and a, uh, somebody else put it another way. Coach Greg Ty, he said, "Man, look, at the end of the day, man, we got twenty two scrimmage games, and you know, it, it's it's yeah, it's for the C Mac championship. But at the end of the day, it's all about going up that road, getting that state yeah. ring. I mean, conference is cool, but you know that as." That's been done, you know. Yep. So everybody get a little aggressive, probably, and, and everybody probably like, man, you know, hey, coach trying to get get where I'm going, you know. A couple teams in the conference, D two, they they may give you that snarl, that yeah. you know, they may not like it, but you know, hey, it's it a is. dog fight. But you can be like like Lil Dirk, the voice. You can be the bridge, mm -hmm. yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, right. right. Lil yeah. Dirk, the voice. You can be like the bridge because yeah. it is the scene like it's kind of rough. Like it's kind of like yeah. the coaches are like. But like you coming in, no ulterior motive, no animosity. To be honest, I don't even know y'all. <laughs> like, exactly. so you come like you can be the bridge. Like yeah. you can be the one that's like, okay, now what's the problem? So that's why I was um just wondering how would you connect because that connection could be life changing for the pro for this program and for like our like for the coaches that's in the city. Like 
really, and not even the CMAC, really. I'm talking about GCL, the GMC, the MWC, I mean, right. the MVC. This, I'm talking about the whole city and the whole Midwest, really. It, it's crazy that we sit here because, like, it's it, it's all, like, full circle. Like, when Coach Wine first got to Hughes, you know, a lot of people like, man, who is this guy? He from exactly. Wine, but, you know, he, yeah. he, ain't, he ain't no Game type of guy. You know, like, Coach Wine, a real, a real vocal guy. He's real educated and like you know a lot of guys around here like man you know this guy can't coach us you know you know you right. get that stuff like it, it's all about what you do that first game what you show them man, man oh, everybody gonna have their opinion about you everybody gonna say this about you people gonna talk good about you people gonna talk bad about you I don't care yeah, 13 let's, let's years get out here and work man 13 years later they say he was the best coach mm -hmm. of all through the like so right. well and that's the, from a standpoint of games like you, you look at games and uh, I've always said I don't back down from Anybody as far as scheduling, like, oh, you want to schedule? Okay, we'll schedule. Like, I, that's just the way I've been. The, re the record at the end of the day does not matter. At the end, no, of, the day, at the end no. of the day, it doesn't matter. All, the, all that matters is that, that's from a basketball standpoint. We can talk about life after, but we're talking about just basketball standpoints. Are your kids ready when it comes sectionals, district sectionals, and region? Are they ready? Yeah. And if they're not ready, then that's on you for not preparing them to be ready. And so I think from a standpoint of what we're going to try to accomplish, do I want to win the CMAC? Absolutely. Do I want to beat every team I play on my schedule? Absolutely. You know? Hey, I hope that you enjoyed this interview. But before we get started, can you do me a favor? Press that button right there. Press the subscribe button for your chance to win free course side takeover apparel. A shirt of your choice. Even a hat. So, thanks for listening to the podcast. Hope that you press that button I said and subscribe. Enjoy. Today, you know, I want to get these kids ready to play in the tournament. And my goal is to every year compete for that region championship. Like that's what you want. You know, that's it right. doesn't it does not matter and if we went twenty two and out yeah. and lost in the first round. That's a waste of season. <laughs> what's it matter? Yeah, yeah. You know, so I want to win the C Mac. I want to win every game, but I want to win that region. I want to get that. I want to get that, and I want to have the kids be able to play for a state championship, be in that final four. That'd be that'd be fantastic. Yes, sir. Who is the player you look forward to most developing and coaching? Ooh. As far as like here, it's it, I got to be real honest with you guys. Like it, it's been such a late start for us mm -hmm. that I've had like three workouts with these kids. So with three workouts. I'm looking at it from, I've got so many kids that I don't even know. You know, like we got kids that couldn't make it to some workouts because they're on vacation. Uh, but after watching film and, and things like that, I'm really excited about uh, all of our underclassmen, you know, our freshmen, sophomores, and juniors that are coming through. Um, I'm excited for our seniors. You know, you got, uh, we got what, Sparks, and we've got uh, Jay and, Leave. We've got one more senior, maybe. No, we have. We have some transferred. So, like, we've got a very small senior class. But I'm excited for them because this is their senior year. Yeah. You know, like this is it. This is it. And if you can't get excited about that, and uh, I've challenged, and I'll just put them out there. I'll let him hear this. But you know, from Jay Sean's standpoint, uh, this has got to be his team. Yeah. You know, it's got to be his team, and he's got to lead it and lead it from a positive standpoint. And then what we want him to also do is develop a uh, more rounded game. You know, I want to develop him because he's 5'11", 5'10". So if he wants to play the next level, it's going to be as a point guard. It's not going to be as a shooting guard. So he's got to be that all-around guard. Sure. Now, we're still going to have uh, probably Marvin run the one, but I, I like a double-headed – Point guard. I want Jay to be able to do it too, and you know, watching film and uh, from my standpoint, you know, we as a team at, at Hughes, I'm just going to say we from now on, uh, we turn the ball over too much. You know, overall, everybody did, and if we can eliminate these silly turnovers, then we get more shots on the goal. When we get more shots on the goal, we score more points. We score more points, it's hard for them to beat us. So you got to value those possessions. Value big time. Now, what's the what's the outlook on the next two to three years 
for your program here at Hughes? What's the What's the thing you wanted to change the most about what you've seen that you dislike since you've been here? Uh, I wouldn't say anything I dislike. I think it's more of a, uh, from a standpoint of an outsider coming in. So I wasn't involved with the previous coaching staff. So looking at it from that standpoint, uh, I think our kids are, and this happens with programs sometimes, our kids are used to, I guess, taking in the benefits of what others did. I guess that's the best way of putting it. Man, they ain't never lie. And so, you know, they don't see they don't see you riding the bike. They just know this is the way Hughes was. They don't see, you know, the struggle that you guys were talking about before we went on. You know, winning one game and coach's first year. You know, like they don't see that struggle. They just know this is the, what it is now. This is the tradition, right? right. So they they think they just come in and it's, it's gonna be that's gonna happen. Like it ain't it ain't, it ain't, it ain't gonna be that way. And. Hughes went from being, and I'm, from my perspective, Hughes went from being the hunted or hunter yeah. to now they're being the hunted. That's it. Right. You know, and so they went from being the ones that are chasing the tasks and the Withrows and the Woodwards and the Aikens at the time to now they are that team. Now it's Taft and if you look at the last 10 years, it's Taft and Hughes. Taft and Hughes. So they've won four each, four C-Max each. So that's they're now that side of it. And so our kids don't know that. Our kids right now think, well, this is this is how things go. And so uh, when I got introduced, I told them, I said, we're going to do these things, but you're going to earn it. You're going to work for it. You're going to earn it. Uh, one of the things I've learned is, you know, from a coach perspective, kids all love the gear. <laughs> yeah, you know, for sure. right? they love the swag, but you have to earn that swag. Got to. And so in order to have that H on your chest. You're gonna to have to put in the hours, and I ain't saying you know like you're gonna to have to pay, you're gonna to have to do a billion dollars worth of fundraising, but I'm saying, you know, we have study halls at eight fifteen in the morning. You gotta be there. Yeah. If you ain't there, you ain't you ain't gonna be on this team. And you know, we start study halls, and next week we start. So it's like we're gonna be in the classroom right away. And if I see that you don't have the academic side of it, then you ain't gonna have the basketball side of it either. Hey, I love it. <laughs> I love it. It's deja vu to me, man. I'm telling you, it's deja vu. I remember we had to play in our busted up shoes, man, because we ain't earned it. Like, we had had a bad practice right before the game. And he had coach, like, coach like, man, you know what? I ain't giving y'all that stuff. We played in old jerseys, old shoes. He played us so shoes. wrong. He set the new jerseys on the chairs <laughs> when we walked in and gave <laughs> us the old jerseys. Yep. That's a great that's a great way to put it, man. You got to make kids earn it because I feel like these days a lot of stuff is given too easy oh, yeah. to a lot of the kids like that. And that's why a lot of the kids feel entitled. You got kids that don't show up and work hard every day, but they get the new gear with the, with the guys that's been here doing the right. work. And that, that ain't how it works, man. That's that's people, I think a lot of coaches got to get back to doing that, man. Get back to the old, the old stuff, man. Make the guys earn it, man. Yeah. It is. I think it's generational, too, because I don't like – I don't want to say we build different. You ain't got to make the kids. I hated this too. We ran. He made us run to the levee in the cold. Like Coach Wines do some of the craziest stuff, but I guess this stuff. He used to always say, if you can get a player to run through a wall for you, get him to do anything. Yeah. Didn't nobody quit after that. We came. We ran back here and got done practicing. Didn't nobody like if you like it's stuff he used to do like that. Just you know, like, all right. I guess that's his way of saying if we was bought in. I guess I don't know, but. But it's like stuff like that. Players now, if you do a player like that nowadays, you won't have a team. Well, you, the challenge, the, 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 from the standpoint of being challenged, some yeah. kids don't like to be challenged anymore. Exactly. You know, are you willing to accept the challenge and rise above it? You know, and see the benefit of it. You know, like a lot of times they think, oh man, coach is just doing that because he wants to be a jerk to us. You know, or, you know, like, why is he doing this? Uh, and from my standpoint as a coach, I try to pride myself in also explaining the why we're doing things. Uh, you know, it, it came from, uh, I was lucky enough to go to Vegas and do a clinic and saw uh, Bob Huggins speak there. And Huggins was like, how many of you guys did zigzag drills as kids, you know, going down the court and zigzagging when you were, you know, being taught basketball from the coach? I'm like, oh yeah, all the time, every day. Every day of practice we did zigzag. He goes, how many times do you do that in a game? Never, hey, never, so true. Yeah, never, sure. like, yeah. never like zigzag and <laughs> stop, and their defender's like, all right, you know, you know, the guy's like, you got me, and turns the other way and gets to the sideline. It's never like that. He goes, 
So I stopped doing it. You know, if you don't do it in the game, why do it? You know, and uh, from the point in all that is like, if kids sometimes would understand the why we do things, then they'd be more willing to do it. Uh, and so, you know, everything we do in practice is game related. I don't do suicides. I don't do suicides in practice because one, it takes away from practice time. Two, you've never had to do a sprint and then a sprint and then a sprint and then a sprint. You never have that. You have sprinting and stopping and holding and sliding. And so we do different things like that, change the direction, but we'll never do just a suicide. Like it, to me, it's pointless. Now, if we want to hold a kid accountable for something, we'll have something for that. There will be extra running, uh, but never practice time. It's after practice. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yes. So, so man, let's dig into this five star, man, because you know a lot of people don't know about five star. A lot of people miss out on that opportunity, mm -hmm. and I can say I was fortunate enough to make one and miss one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was, you know, I made one and missed one. Um, so, tell 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 everybody about that experience. Like, what 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 was it like coaching down there at five star? Also, well, five star changed from the time I started till the time. And uh, the, the whole reason I got a head coaching job in Florida was because of Five Star Basketball. Uh, so I went to uh, Five Star Basketball in Hampton Sydney College in Virginia. Uh, and I was coaching the camp there, first time working it. And we had some absolute dogs. I'm talking like uh, monsters. Okay, you have 6'10, 6'11. Uh, it was, this was also, you know, the years that like John Wall went to camps and, you know, mm -hmm. oh yeah, like, some players were there and uh, while I was there uh, the guy who runs uh, Team Florida who was a Nike IBL school and now they're with Adidas uh, but I was telling him I'm like man I, and this is God's honest truth I applied I still have every single school I, man, I'm like this guy who keeps a list uh, but I have a schools I got applied for 34 teaching jobs in Northern Kentucky and Cincinnati because this was again I started late so I was trying to get a teaching job and didn't get a single interview, not one. I'm like, man, I can't even get an interview. And uh, and I told Coach Harris, and he's like, Brandon, he goes, they're dying for good coaches in Florida. Like, absolutely, if you applied and they saw you from Kentucky, which I love Cincinnati, and I think the basketball is here. If you follow me on Twitter, I think the, I was reading, yeah, I was reading. I think the level of talent over here and everything is way more than what we have in Kentucky, but Kentucky is – the basketball state. I was, just, reading, I was reading when you said that. I'm like, I never thought about yeah. that until you tweeted it. I'm like, that makes so much. Like, I think you tweeted something like Cincinnati got like you said. I can name like, uh, like I think you said like over 100 D1 players. I think it's, I don't want to miss, miss, miss. It's just in the C Mac in the last 10 yeah, years. Yeah. I can name 13 of them. That's what you said. Yeah, we named 13 of them That's in the last 10 yeah. years. Yeah. Okay, I couldn't name you. And this is just what there's six schools in the C Mac, right? Yeah. Six schools. I can name you 13 players that got D1 scholarships from the C Mac. Yeah. All right. And if all the schools in the ninth region combined. All right, the ninth region is Northern Kentucky. That's mm -hmm. all the Boone County, Kenton County schools, uh, except for Scott and Simon Kenton. So you're looking at Cuffcat, looking at Ryle, you're looking at uh, Dixie Heights and Holy Cross, um, mm -hmm. all these big schools. I'm talking like Dixie Heights has almost 2,000 kids in it. Okay, I couldn't name you seven <laughs> D1 schools, D1 players. I'm serious, like I can't name you seven D1 players from the ninth region. That's 17 schools. And I can name you 13 from six. That's so the level of town's there. So, but in Florida, it's even it's yeah. even more. Yeah. All right, every school has a D1 kid on it, it seems like. Uh, but he told me, he's like, man, apply. So I applied for five jobs, uh, and they not only interviewed me, they flew me down, put me in a condo. Dang. Yeah. On, in Fort Lauderdale, put me on the beach, let me hang out there for a week while they inter while all five schools interviewed me, took their every day, and uh, came back, I was offered four. I chose the one that was closest to the beach. And then I get there and I'm like, man, it's close to the beach, but. Those guys wanna be on the beach. They wanna be on the beach. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it was, it, was a, it was a great experience for me, you know, it was, a, it was an inner city school, you know, we had 72% African American students. Uh, we had a great opportunity though with these kids. You know, I had kids whose mom and dad both were in prison. You know, I had kids whose mom and dads were both, you know, successful investors. You know, like we had yeah. every level. Yeah. Of, mixed everything. Mixed yeah. with everything. Uh, but I also got a chance to work with like the Boys and Girls Club and we ran camps with two NBA veterans like Alvin Williams from the Toronto Raptors came and he worked there with us. And 
uh, did it for free. Like we just ran these things for these kids to come in and experience basketball. And like that elevated my love for the game and for helping expand the game to kids who normally wouldn't get that opportunity, even more so than what I already had. So I, I it would, but without five-star basketball, without coaching these elite kids, I wouldn't have the opportunity. And I wouldn't have met Brian White. I wouldn't have met two of my really good friends and uh, Phil Washington, who's a head coach in Indianapolis, and, and Eric Pittman, who's a college coach down in Tennessee. It's like I didn't, would never have met these guys had it not been for five stars. So I've uh, been blessed from a basketball and also a pers perspective from it. That's cool. Um, I'm just curious. I actually just thought about it while you was in the middle of talking. What went in the decision of leaving a D1 caliber player? <laughs> you, mean, you mean Jacob Meyer? Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to be honest, like, Holy Cross, uh, from my perspective, is a top three team in the ninth region this year. Okay, in Kentucky, we have one state champion. We don't have the four classes that Ohio has. You have one state champion. Dang, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah we, I, we have, I love it. Yeah, like we. It's tough, though. Holy Cross, we had 305 kids, I think. Something like that. 350 or 305. I know the five was in there somewhere. Uh, three, well, even if you say 350 students. That means we have about 175 boys. Wait, wait. You mean for the whole school? Yeah. Why? <laughs> yeah. So we have 175 boys. Uh -huh. And at Cuff Cat, they have 900 boys alone. And you're playing against, like, that's, 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 you, they're in the same district, not just region, they're in the same district yeah, as okay. us. But Jacob Meyer, and uh, they have a lot of time with Jacob Meyer and Javier Ward, and Sam Gibson's a 6'11 junior, and Javier Ward's another really good guard in the junior class. Uh, but Jacob has been offered by Northern, been offered by, I think, IUPUI, and other people are showing that. interest. Uh, Coach Miller uh, and his staff have, you know, they're keeping their eye on him, and I talked to him last week about him. And, uh, at the end of the day, it wasn't about which school was going to be better basketball-wise. It was more about which school would I have the most impact at. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, and I told my wife this when I decided to take the job, when Andrew offered it to me and, and Dr. Williams offered it to me, I said, if I leave Connor tomorrow teaching and I leave Holy Cross tomorrow coaching, those kids are going to be fine. Like, they got the support system. They got that stuff. They're going to be fine. I can go to Hughes and make a huge impact on kids that just lost two coaches in a span of three months. So from my perspective, it wasn't about, man, I can really win some games at Hughes. Now, I think we can, but it was more from a perspective of I can impact a lot more kids here than I could there. And Jacob is going to be fine. Like He's a D1. I didn't make Jacob Meyer a D1 player. Right? Right. I didn't do that. He came in as a D1 player. You know, he just, we just modified and helped accelerate his skills a little bit. You know, we, we did things like that, but it was hard to leave. I mean, it, it was the hardest thing I've had to do in professionally in my entire career, but uh, this is where not only did I want to be, but this is where I felt I needed to be. Cool. Well, we're going to get into our takeover segment of the day where we ask you a couple questions and you can answer them to the best of your ability and as honest as you want. Best basketball shoe to play in, in your opinion? Nike. Good, good answer. I ain't never. All right, I want Nike or Jordan, depending on okay. the shoe. I'm now, now, when you say Jordan, we ain't talking about 2006 Jordans. That I know. Put now. You know, they're I like, know. I, feel, I don't know. They're why. heavy now. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I feel like the materials change so much on yeah. Jordans. Like, especially, like, from where they were back in the day, they were, like, actual, like, he used them as basketball shoes. Like, right. now they, they like, Stop. yeah, they just style shoes. Like, I don't, I can't see myself pooping in a pair yeah. of Jordans. Is there anything better than the old Hyperdunks? Man, I, hey, <laughs> hey, listen, I seen some. I was at the gym uh, the other day. I seen somebody in a pair of the blue and yellow hyper dunks. I was like, man, I want. I wanted to bounce yeah. off his feet because I. <laughs> that was some of my favorite hoop shoes. They were light. They were like comfortable. I like, mean, you can't beat them. Hey, I still got a pair of red and black hyper dunks from when I coached the Seneca in my in my closet. Man, keep these things. These are the best shoes you could get as no. far as like balling and like that's. Damn. I think that's the best me. ones. I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a couple questions now. Who's the best basketball player you've seen play at five star? Mm, at five star? At five star. This tough matter of fact, and I'm gonna make it easier. Give me your top five. At five star? At five star. Oh 
Oh man, that's a tough one. There's a lot of good players. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why I said, man, this is a tough one. Uh, I'll give you. No, I can't. I can't think of the kid's first name. His last name is uh, is Dozier. PJ. Yeah, PJ. PJ oh yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I like PJ. All right. I think he played at South Carolina. Yeah. yeah. Um, Aaron Scales. Okay. Six foot ten big man who ended up playing at Cleveland State. Uh, very good player. Um, my first year of doing it was John Walls mm. here. Fastest kid I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> like, for real, like, the fastest kid I've ever seen. Like, there's no, we do this perfection drill, and the kid does it in two dribbles, can go full court in two dribbles. No, never seen anything like it. Um, we had this kid down in Florida. His last, his, his uh, last name will escape me, but he uh, ended up going to Memphis. He, uh, his school he went to was uh, Dr. Phillips. Man, it's gonna kill me that I can't remember the kid's name. Uh, I know his nickname was Pookie, Rashawn Pookie Williams, I think is his last name. That name sounds familiar. Familiar. Real, real good. Familiar. Like, I'm talking like, yeah, he was really quick. Uh, fifth one, mm, I, honestly, I think the kid I had from uh, Seneca, Brandon Trotter, played there. Mm -hmm. He was really too, so. And his six, I know he was gonna say his six would have been Angel Rivera. I knew it. <laughs> no, because when Angel when Angel chose coming to Hughes, did not go to my school. I said, no, I, ain't, I ain't doing that. Hey, look, I have to tell the story of Angel out, not on the podcast. <laughs> Another question: um, Mario Crystal's down into three words. Uh, hard work. I mean, that's number one for me. Is well, our kids gonna? I guess that's two words, but I'm gonna put them together. Hard work yeah, is, is number one. Uh, servant. I think we gotta be a servant to all the people that we are working yeah, with yeah. and for. Uh, you know, if we, if our basketball teams would just learn to serve each other, you think about it. If a player was like more of a servant leader rather than a, I need to get my twenty, and it's like I don't care who scores, we'd be uh, a lot better off in it uh, in family. From the standpoint of, you know, I do have seven kids, but you know, it's like my kids are part of this family. You mentioned, you know, kids having excuses about I got to go babysit. I had a kid down in Florida, uh, and Trey, he, he's like, man, coach, he goes, I'd love to be on the basketball team. He goes, but I got a two-year-old, you know, I just can't do it. I'm like, bring him to practice. Bring him to practice. Yeah. I'm like, bring him to practice. I got, and I told him I, at the time my son was uh, three. I'm like, I got a three-year-old who's going to be here, and I've got a four-year-old daughter who's going to be here. We've got one on the way, and she's going to be in a stroll, and literally was in a stroller <laughs> at practice. It's like, bring them. You know, we'll, we'll be fine. You know, they'll be on the sideline. If you need to step out and do something with them, that's fine. But I'd rather you be part of this program than not be part of it for that. That's right. Yeah. Who's your top five NBA players? Mm. That's a good one. Uh, all right. So I'm going to lead with. Who my son is named after, Isaiah Thomas. Oh, uh, cool. Uh, okay. Uh, he would be my favorite point guard uh, overall. And, and when I ask that question, I mean your five. Right. I don't, I don't mean the best overall. No, I'm just giving you my yeah. favorite players. Uh, so Isaiah Thomas, uh, Larry Bird. Nice. I'm going to go Magic. It's hard not to put Magic on there. Uh, Kobe and Mike. I like that five. That's a, that's a tough five. So you can coach any player in the city of Cincinnati. Who would it be? Like present or past? Yeah, <laughs> both. Either or. Oh, any kid in in Cincinnati. That, that to ever to ever play on play in the city. Who would it be? You know how I would like. To, you know how I would like to coach. Uh, and he, I'm not gonna. He's not a, he's not a Cincinnati kid. Okay. Uh, James Dudes. Oh, yeah. Oh, from yeah. Dakota East. Yeah. 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 James Dudes. James man. was. Look, I had, I had the opportunity to watch James when he was in high school, and I was a young guy in college, and like he just was fluid. Mm -hmm. He was just absolutely 
It was a nice move. Yeah, yeah smooth, smooth kid. Game. Like he did. Like at the end of the day, you go, just put a twenty. It didn't even seem like he shot the ball. So, <laughs> like you know, like he just had a, just a real natural flow to his game, and uh, I think he's very underrated in terms of. What, what he did on the court. I think he underrated trainer also. Oh, he, yeah. He's definitely oh, a great he's... trainer. I've seen him move around the way, doing a little work with the kids. He's definitely an underrated yeah. trainer. Well, you know what I appreciate about James, too, is like, and, and I'm not, I don't want to step on the trainer's toes, but James doesn't just promote what he does. You know, like, he's, he's not that trainer who's like, oh, look, I got this kid, I'm doing this with this kid. And, you know, he shows what he does, but he's not doing it in a way that you're like, He's just trying to get more money. Yeah. Right. You know, he's doing it from a standpoint of like, I, you can really tell that he loves training kids. So I, he's very good at what he does, but he was very good at what he did on the court. But I would sure. love to coach James. Okay, he That's a good pick. All right, um, a player listening to this who just want to come here and looking for a new opportunity, what can they get coming to play for you and your program here at Hugh? Uh We play a style that is more of the modern style of offense and defense. Like we, we are going to absolutely push our kids to get to the next level. Uh, if you do follow me on Twitter, every time we do something with huge basketball, it's gonna be, you'll see hashtag D1 standard. Everything we do is a D1 standard. You know, we expect a 2.3 GPA minimum. Like that's not the, you know, that's not what we're striving for. We're striving for more than that. And if we achieve the two, three, then we've done our job, but we wanna get that, you know, three, five, four, oh. So everything we do on and off the court is going to push these kids to get to that next level. And one of the things that I, I, I think has helped Jacob Meyer in his recruitment, and I know it has because Northern uh, said it when they offered it to him, is in our offense, we do a lot of ball screen uh, things out of it. We do dribble drive, but it's a modified dribble drive with ball screen interaction stuff. And the way he's coming off a of ball screen, you look at any game, Kyle George Pro now, it's so... On the balls, yeah, yeah, all the time. And being able to read that from a point guard perspective is huge for these kids. And so if you come, like the kids that come to Hughes, they're not gonna go into college going, oh, I don't know what we're doing. You're gonna be prepared for that. Uh, our workouts are D1 standard. You know, they are built around that. Kevin Johnson, who played at UC being an assistant, he knows what it takes to get there. He's working, these, he's gonna be working these kids out and they're gonna see what it takes to get to that next level. Uh, we don't just talk it, you know, we're going to push it through them. When they, we sit in film session, uh, we're going to be showing them how college coaches are going to be looking at film with you. Uh, if you've ever sat in a film session with kids, it is the most mind-boggling thing in the world because they're sitting there and they probably spend more time watching themselves of course, or putting yeah. somebody else on blast about them just getting blocked or broken or something rather than saying, okay, we're looking at this from a team perspective of what are we not doing what's and so the right what's the right play and so we've been blessed here at Hughes I mean this, we're in our film room right now like we've got a film room our kids are going to be in here they're going to love being in here they're going to learn how to love being in here uh, I'm a stats guy so I break down things on a numbers wise uh, but our kids are going to be prepared in the classroom on the court in the film room and then from our my perspective kids have to be taught how to be recruitable. Like you, you think about Twitter and Instagram and stuff, go onto these teenagers' Twitter and Instagram pages and look at their bio and you're like, you can't put that in there. No, right. Eventually, they recruit you. I can't recruit you. Like you've got this word in there that I can't even show my principal or my, uh, my president of the university. He'll be like, no, we ain't gonna take that kid. So we're actually gonna have, uh, come October, uh, let's see, trials of 29. So like the first week of November, one of our after practice things or before practice, I have to decide how we're gonna do it is going to be social media cleanup. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to be taught how to promote yourself on social media and how to make yourself recruitable. So you come here, it's not just about the court, it's off the court and on the court, and it's all like from that. a certain standard. I like that. I love it. Yeah, I, I, I like that love. a lot. I like that a lot. Love. Last but not least, who should we have on the podcast next? And if you know him, you should plug us. Who should you have on the podcast next? Player, Player coach, anybody. anybody. Have you had Meacham on here yet? Not yet, no, no, not yet, no. not yet. Right. That's a cool. I would say, I would say Meacham, uh, and if you couldn't get Meacham, uh, from somebody who's been around the city for a long time, he may not coach in the C Mac. Uh, it ain't got to be C Mac, be anywhere. Mike Price. That's a great one. Mike That's Price good. is a great one. Yeah, Mike Price has been, and he's actually involved with uh, 
Meacham, you know, so like okay. you might be able to get a double header with Meacham and that's Price. Right. Hey, that's a great. Okay, so that's great. Okay. Now, um, this is our segment we got called Eggs Didi, Eggs Diz and Dwight. We've opened up the floor to you. We've been drilling you with questions all day. So this is when we open up the floor to you to ask us anything. If you want to ask us anything before we get out of, out of here, this is the opportunity. Yeah, because you guys are Q's guys, yeah. right? So <laughs> I have the opportunity to ask Q's guys because this is one of the things we're going to do is I'm, we're going to make an alumni thing where we, I, want kids, I want guys coming in and not just, you know, the modern alumni. I want to reach out. I want yeah. old school when alumni he, coming he, in here. See this? He, I am a part of the alumni foundation. There we go. So, so I'm a part of the alumni foundation. Me and Carlos can actually get a, stat, a team together for you. So we're gonna talk about that off the air. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, so if you could give any advice to these youth basketball players, and I know you guys were on staff, so you guys have already talked to them, but moving forward, all right, what would that advice be? You can go ahead. I won't let you go, mm -hmm. man. Oh, all right. It ain't gonna get no easier than this. Like, by, by me saying that is, what was easy is already done. It's about to get older now. For everybody that's coming in here, it's about to get harder now. Excuse my language. So, but for everybody that's coming and for everybody that's here, you got to put the work in. Nothing's going to be given to you, and everything is going to be earned. But you got to put that work in. Nothing's going to get easy. Like, it's not going to get no easier from here on out. This is, this is where the grind begins. So, I say that to say just don't give up because it's not going to get no easier. My thing is, we built a tradition, we built a legacy, and we built something here that, that we want to keep going on. We want to keep Hughes on the up and up. We want to keep reinventing the program. So if I could tell a kid anything, it would be come in here and work like you weren't Hughes or, or, or like you Hughes is your family name. Come in here and work as hard as you can. Wear Hughes on your back. Don't worry about your last name when you're here with your team. Focus on what's going to help your team succeed, what's going to help you succeed, and always think about how it affects you when you do something. Brandon made a good point actually earlier, too, when he said that on a lot of guys, a lot of guys just see the fruit of the labor but don't see the labor. They see we won 20 games in a row for five straight years. They see that y'all made it to districts, y'all made it to regionals. We held that trophy up a couple times. We wore the C-Mac four years at but they don't see what we, they don't see the one in 10. They don't see the six in the 16 years. They don't see the, they just see dang Hughes is this powerhouse. No, we was terrible. So, but they don't know that we put that work in. So coming here, it's, it's, it's going to be work. It's not going to be no walk in the park. It's not going to be easy. And he let y'all know that our interview. So Nothing's good. come here and be ready to work. Let me ask you guys this. I know I'm stepping on you. I'm being the host right now. But good. Not, that's good. That's right, so, you... Something that's always boggled my mind about CMAC, not just CMAC, but inner city schools in general. Like we had this issue in Jefferson County and Louisville, and we had it down in Florida. Where Florida, there are no like transfer rules. Like you can be playing one day at one school, and the next yes. day you're playing against them. Yeah. So let me ask you guys from a player perspective why kids quit to leave now? You go, go. Man, I, I think it gets hard for kids, and then they. they they want to follow a friend or something. Let, I know, let me start it off. Here. In 2011, was it 11? 2011, Aaron, this didn't used to happen. The, you used to can go to any school you want and play the next day, literally. It could be somebody playing at Withrow versus Aiken, and you transfer to Aiken, and you play Withrow again. Right. 2011, Aaron Owen transferred to Tab. It was a whole big court issue, back and forth. They didn't want him to play. Ever since that came, players got to sit out. Players got to sit out. That's when they put in this whole CPS rule, this district rule, this OSHA stuff. That's where all this came at. Now players got to sit out because they had this big old court battle within each other that, okay, now he transferred, like, for example, Aaron, Aaron Thomas, Yeah. His he went to Aiken, then he transferred to Withrow. He didn't have to sit up nothing. He just played. Right. But when Aaron Owen left him with the tab, that's when everything got kind of iffy. Now, I think that it's generational because they put stimulations on it. You see in the NBA, LeBron changed the narrative. I'm going to sign these one and ones and I'm going to just keep jumping everywhere to everywhere. Steph Curry changed the three-point line. Generational. He pulling up from half court. You ain't never noticed if you in the gym, ain't nobody taking it to the rack no more. Ain't nobody trying to get it to the big. They trying to pull up from the volleyball line. 
Same thing with the transfer rule. They see that it's cool to go, okay, this team terrible, all right, they ain't good enough. They're going to play with my friend over here. This team not good, all right, this coach leaving, okay, this principal gone, okay, this, whatever, let me go over here. Not knowing that, okay, you got to sit out. Not knowing you, that what um, what they ain't calling you running from the grind. That's what I think most players are doing. You think that the, no, these players are making millions in the league. These players are going to win championships. You're going to transfer to play with your friends. I call it running from the grind. So that's what I think the biggest thing is. These players are following trends. Mm -hmm. Like when I was in school, there wasn't a lot of players bouncing around. You, that's why I said the only the only scenario we had was a player that player that played for Coach Wine in here at Hughes. Coach Wine gave him the keys to the car. He left him the next year and went to Tech. That's the first time I really started seeing like. Players move. After that, another player to move. Another player that went to Aiken. Then another player that went to West High. But it's just the Ohio thing. It's just OSHA. But before 2011, you can go wherever you want. Before 2011, you can go wherever you please. Now, we ain't gonna get into the story. We can talk about the later. <laughs> what, 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 yeah, what. But... It's the Courtside Takeover Podcast. I'm Diz. And I'm Diddy, and we out.